So for the last communication, we're going to have uh, Francesca Greco, um, the possibility of spatial origins, a cross-cultural approach to the platonic Cora. And um, Francesca, now she's at the University of Hildesheim for PhD, I guess, yes. maybe? OK. <laughs> so OK, just take your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the invitation, the possibility to be here, and for the organization of this conference. I will talk about Cora and have to say that in, in my studies about the connection between negativity and spatiality, I have become fascinated with the difficult and obscure, as Platon describes us in Timaeus, uh, concept of Cora, which is usually translated in uh, different ways as space, field, stretch or place. My view is that the choratical myth of creation can be used to support an understanding of the concept of the origin that is dis distinguished from a distant ancestral moment in the time or from when something began. And furthermore, can strengthen a rethinking of relationality, spatiality, and negativity. As Timaeus illustrates, after a prior description of the universe regarding two different kinds of knowledge, there are two kinds of being corresponding to them. The one, the one uncreated, unstructable, immovable, which is seen by intelligence only. The other, created, which is always becoming in a place and vanishing out of place, and is apprehended by opinion and sense. There is also a third nature, that of space, which is indestructible and is perceived by a kind of spurious reason without the help of sense. Introduced by necessity, Cora forces us to rethink categories in general, and the dichotomy with Timaeus is used to divide the cosmos in particular. Through a cross-cultural approach to Cora, based on Nishida's, Derrida's, and Heidegger thinking, I would like to propose a new understanding of concepts like origin and creation. I find it particularly intriguing that Cora is designated as mother, and for this reason has been referred to as she. Since to be a mother is unthinkable without the child, Cora's space is unthinkable without the thing she's hosting into her. Such would be akin to an abstract geometrical and empty space, which Cora cannot be, according to Plato's description. Equally unthinkable would be suggesting that the things that find or take place in her can be without her, as a child couldn't couldn't come to the world without a parent, and the child makes the mother um, as a mother as well. This makes it significant to investigate the kind of relation she entertained with those things. She and the things taking place in her are not only deeply connected, but in a mutual relationality, in which the one is not think thinkable without the other. This kind of relationality should, shouldn't be thought like a dependence or interdependence relationship, rather as a structure, irremediably changing with the change of each single element. There is no Cora without things and vice versa. In the Platonic Cosmo, <coughs> Cora is a third kind located between being and becoming, between ideas and copies. And because of its inconvenient and comfortable intermediate uh, position, her interpretation requires a great hermeneutical effort. Plato's discourse about Cora is anything but unequivocal and unambiguous. He writes, being and generation and space, the three existed before the heaven, and the north of vessel or vessel of generation, moistened by water and inflamed by fire, and taking the form of the air and earth, assumed various shapes. Despite the very problematic position, 
<coughs> of Cora, my question remains, what is Cora? <laughs> Even after two and a half millennia, it is still true that there is a difficulty in arriving, there is a difficulty in arriving at an exact, exact notion of this third kind. But this is not due to a lack of language or um, of our philosophical ability to describe. The, the difficulty is defining Cora and structure, structural. Indeed, the notion of Cora challenges the possibility of language and the ontological tradition bound to, him, to it. <coughs> but more deeply, she deconstructs every dichotomous approach to thinking. Interpreters nowadays still struggle with trying to understand Cora, which cannot be pure matter, Hule, as suggested by Aristotle and physics for neither can be neither can she be merely a place like Topos, or even nothing concrete like a Kantian regulative idea or an abstraction from the reality of Topos as a particular place. Indeed, in this way, she would not be Cora <laughs> anymore, but instead Hule, Topos, regulative idea, abstraction, and so on. Here, <coughs> Cora is already showing one of her central characteristics, most of ignored in her interpreters. She's withdrawing, and she's very contradictory. As as also the etymology um, can reveal. Here are a couple of examples like kera, widow, ketos, lack deprivation, and the, um, the verbs koreo, to make space, withdraw, back out, but also proceed, advance, um, koriso, uh, to split, to distinguish, or korismos, different, separation, spacing. <coughs> In what follow, I will try to sketch three fundamental levels of Platon elaboration of Cora. Plato is using mythological metaphors and similitudes to describe something which I shall call the receptacle or nurse of generation. <coughs> Its language remains vague because Cora is presented to us in a dreamy manner and things in habit hair may be compared to images made of gold which are continually assuming new form. Somebody asks what they are. If you, don't, if you do not know, the safest answer is to reply that they are gold. The receptiveness of Cora can be thought of like the inorodous liquids which are prepared to receive scents, or the smooth and soft materials of which figure are impressed. Plato describe, describes Cora primarily ex negativo. That is to say, because, because of our ontological standpoint, it's not only possible to reach, to reach a comprehension of Cora by starting from what she is not. According to the strong ontological approach, she can be formulated through the logic of neither nor. In the same way, space or matter is neither earth nor fire nor air nor water, but an invisible and formless being which receives all things and in, and in an incomprehensible manner partakes of the intelligible. The matter which receives every variety of form must be formless. She's not fixed. But she, is, but she is acting and moving in a sinuous and continuous way through her forms. She has no substance, but for this reason Derrida, and for this reason Derrida, chose her as a banner against every, any kind of substantialism. She cannot be subsumed to any kind of representation as well. She, happen, she, appears, she appears through things, but she is not those things. She has no sub substance which we can appeal to in order to refer us to Cora because she does not exist in herself. 
but only with or better through between the things and elements that inhabit in her. Which things, <coughs> which things and elements are understood not as substance but as a qualities, because the four elements themselves are of inexact nature and easily pass into one another and are too transient to be detained by any one name. Well, she has no clear definition. She cannot stand any synonymous and must be called only with their proper name. But in the Timaeus, Plato also gives us some positive features of Cora. These features are not going, are, aren't going to make it simple to retrace the nature of Cora. We can subdivide Cora's feature again in three ranks. Necessity, the giving birth of all, all things, and a simultaneous way uh, to be lack and excess, to lack and to, and to excess. Cora not only is said to be necessary, for, for we say that all things must be somewhere in space, but an introduction of a third kind is required because the description of the universe will be incorrect or partial with only two principles facing each other. Furthermore, the necessity of Cora is not found simply in her interpretation by Plato's cosmological philosophy. On the one hand, she is symbol of the construction in Derrida's philosophical project, aiming the critic of substantialism and ontology. On the other hand, she is pillar and model for Nishida's philosophical system in which, that's Nishida's quotation, um, that which is, is, must be in place in something. Otherwise, a distinction between is and is not cannot be made. There must be something that envelops the opposition between I and not I within itself. Following the words of Plato's Timaeus, I shall call the receptacle of the ideas in this sense Basho, place, Cora. Needless to say, I am not suggesting that, that what I call Basho is the same as Plato's space um, or receptacle or receptacle, receptacle place. With Cora, Nishida <coughs> want to support his conception of space as the time or Basho. A, a space where all the things can take place and are made possible. This must be, this place must to be empty, or better, or better to say emptied, in order to be ready to receive things. The emptiness of Basho, oblivious of itself, is filling up of things, of, of world. Cora is giving birth of all things, but her creativity is not an active process of creation. She, crea she creates by embracing and receiving thing in herself. Another dualism that she contributes to dismantling is the opposition between active and passive. Cora's creation is neither active nor passive. The one and the other, but, but, but it's both, the one and the other. A concept of simultaneity that Nishida expressed with the kanji soku at the same time. A consequence of this kind of creation via reception and placing is the generation of non-substantial and constant things, just like the receptacle of Cora. We erroneously maintain them to be the letter of element of the word, although they cannot reasonably be compared even to syllab of, uh, of or first compounds. In order to be related, the things must be in a place that can connect them. But simultaneously, what, est what establishes the system of things and what maintains the system must be in a place as well. In order to avoid an infinite regress that wherein the system is placed, is placed as Cora as structure. That is to say, a phenomenological modality to think the thick relationality of space. <coughs> I'm not now speaking of the first principle of things, 
write Plato's about Cora, because she is not a principal, Arke, but structure, context, horizon, a containing principle that may be lignant, lignant to a mother. Cora generates in making possible, in making space for the things and the, and the relation between them. Cora is simultaneous, both a lack and excess. <coughs> Here we see one, once more why having posi positive characterization of Cora does not help with her interpretation, since Cora in itself is in itself contra contradictory, and the element in her easily pass into one another, and they enter into and pass out of her. She suffers under a lack of form, but at the same time, she exists form. Thanks to things passing into and out of her, she assumed all possible forms. She disappeared behind this form and slips away in every attempt to grasp her via form or definition by exceeding it. She's transformation over and over again in different form and emptying herself to us new form and things. In this sense, Cora remains anachronistic with regard to our attempt to grasp her and keep her in a certain form and definition, and she create and recreate herself further. To define her in always to define her is always too late. She is already exceeding this definition and transforming. <coughs> this process developed in the context of the creation of the universe, does not move in a specific direction, like an irreversible progress, maybe tending to the good or led by certain goals, telos, accumulating in time. Indeed, the direction of time is one way. It's, al it's always and inexorably goes forward. In this picture, the movement of creating is an expansion and spreading out of possibilities or things located, or better, relocated in a new constellation and made possible thanks to the support of Cora. Now, in my view, <coughs> is that all these characteristics, we, we are able to think the act of creation and the concept of origin in a very different way, namely special. With Cora, origination is not conceived in terms of backward jump in a temporal ancestral before. In Cora, the origin is timeless blossoming, similarly to the Heideggerian interpretation of Fusis. This origin does not begin, it's already here, and we are always thrown into it. If we do not speak of beginning about Cora, then we also do not speak about ending in our context. As we can similarly grasp in the Sophoclean trage tragedy, Oedipus at Colonus, in which Oedipus is led to exile or death by the ambiguous characters of the Eumenides in an unattainable space, Koros. This kind of creation and trepassing by connecting and splitting through, through in terms of Cora, thought in terms of Cora, gives us an, um, innumerable possibilities to rethink our categories. I want to focus in particular on one, on one of these, <coughs> and propose with Cora the possibility of spatial origin. In the field of play, maybe we, between the indices of grand dichotomies, is insinuated a third pos possibility, named Cora. The speciality of Cora cannot be a principle of creation because her activity is a relational one. Cora's relationship with the ground is of another kind, indeed a third kind. Cora allows us to rethink an origin that breaks with the logic of Arche and with priority. By returning hermeneutical vi vigor to the relational and the spatial, with which in their thoroughness and modality remains unthought. 
In this creation, there is no first place, but a connection and consequently a chiasmatic shaping of meanings, which is itself not fixed, but always open to changes and thought. This open and, and through this openness, it remains itself. Things are mean. Things and meaning are not created ex nihilo, but thought a certain negativity is rather relocated and put into different context with different things in relation. From this new and complex relationality, things and meanings arise. With Cora, it's, a, with Cora, it's about relocating, placing, contextualizing and recontextualizing, connecting, bridging, and finally opening new possibility in the form of meaning now placed in a different context. <coughs> the Coratical origin is a chiasmatic encounter between things with space as a context. In this picture, meaning cross each other, and in this scattering emerge new, con new connotation. Every changing of context is a new origin, and a new phenomenon emerge, and we can speak about origins in plural. Not only the place, but also the phenomenon is now a complex structure, and in incessant changing, and its origin is differentiation. An account of origin and change and transformation based on Cora, together with analytical method of phenomenology that ends with this process, could be called it transformative phenomenology. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Um, I think we can open for comments and then Professor Tablet. I, 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 I would like to learn more about your comparison between Kora and Nishida. Considering the fact that Nishida never uh, used, uh, used the, the word Kora, but only a receptacle place, just a few times. Yes. Um, well, at the beginning of um, Basho, he, he um, um, not quite directly um, Plato, but it speaks about uh, Timaeus, as I quoted, and he writes um, space, the word basho, but in um, katakana. And through this we can uh, think that it's referring to, to Kora in this, uh, in this moment. If I understand uh, what Nishida is proposing in that passage, in that place, maybe, <laughs> is that what he says that, if I'm not mistaken, um, what I call here Basho is the same thing as Plato called Koda as mm -hmm. a receptacle of the ideas or something like that. Yeah. 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 It's right. the contrary. Huh? He says it's not the same. It's, it's, not, the, no, uh, it's, it's not the same. Huh? Sorry. It's not the same. He says it's not, it's not the same. No, uh, he says it's the same only by name or something like yes. that, right? Yes. And he can uh -huh. quote uh, or, or he says that it's the same and not, not the, the exactly the same thing or something. Mm. Yes. Uh -huh. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Well, um, I read here that um, maybe Nishida want to follow uh, Plato in his thinking about space like um, uh, maybe a, a paradoxical instance uh, or so, uh, but obviously he um, here, needless to say, I'm not suggesting that what I call Basho is, in, is the same as Plato. It's not the same, but it's like an um, show here is um, the influence from Plato. <coughs> huh? Or maybe he's wanting to Reconsider Kora from the Japanese standpoint. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. It's so like it's a really yeah, yeah, It's yeah, also yeah. a counter action. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Interpretation or reinterpretation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And maybe because uh, he is trying to. Uh, I want to, to to know your opinion, but maybe because he is trying, she is trying to solve the problem that is unity and multiplicity. 
and you have this uh, problem of the first period uh, philosophy because you have uh, pure experience that finally is this uh, unitarian principle and you have uh, he has to explain the differentiation of multiplicity and he says he's not able to do it so and uh, maybe it's a bunch of yeah it's uh, looking for this uh, I think is searching for what, um, how can how can we think together? The problem is this together. I think by yeah, this yeah. unity and yes, yeah, this is unity and the multiplicity. Uh, so maybe it makes sense the fact that he's trying to rethink yes. Plato to yeah. try to uh, make a, a, an answer to this question. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think Leon has a comment and then. Okay. <coughs> Um, yeah, in the case of Nishida, I think it's important to, um, to think about that he, um, the primary basho for him is Luna uh, basho, basho of nothingness. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's mostly this, uh, this new means something like undetermination, it's not determined. And uh, you, you get different um, specifications of this basho, and you, sometimes you say it's structure. And I think that's not so close to what Nishida wants to say, but once you said openness, and I think openness is pretty close to maybe what Nishida, from my perspective, what he maybe wants to say, because the Munabasho uh, is not itself a structure or a system, but it enables structures and yeah. it enables it makes it possible. to build up. So this kind of openness also connects for me to, um, there's the translation of Logan's Shoborenzo by Tanahashi, and he translates Ku, mm -hmm. which is another expression, but it's closely connected. Um, mm -hmm. Um, he, translated, uh, he translated it as um, boundlessness. And this kind of openness and boundlessness, I think that's a, a pretty interesting phenomenon um, to connect to, to this Torah and also to Nishida's Basho. Um, maybe I can say that um, what I mean with structure, uh, well, I, I took the word from, um, from Derrida and also from Umberto Eco. And uh, structure is always something open. So structure and openne openness um, are really, really close. But I, um, I could not explain uh, the the, um, the word in this uh, in this case. <laughs> okay. Have one last yeah. mm -hmm. uh, what you said is a bit connected to my question. Rather, we mark, you know. <coughs> Wouldn't it be uh, the, the concept of Chora uh, in, in Plato some kind of uh, a, a gaze into the pre-Socratic philosophy? Uh, I mean, into the, as you said, boundlessness, so apeiron of Anaxmander, mm -hmm. and something that is apeiron like infinite, uh, the one that, it, that there is, of course, no the level of ideas that they are co coming to, uh, yeah, some kind of yeah, printed. Uh, in, in the hora uh, or apeira. Uh, so, yeah, this is my remark and the question. And the second question is, in, in what sense in Plato, uh, hora is uh, something that is uh, not substantial? Uh, okay, the, the level of ideas, because this is on its own, they are the most, they are the most. There is this, yeah, the, the level of sexual things they are less, but uh, hora as something that is necessary uh, never, uh, I, you said, uh, indestructible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In what sense it is not? Uh, it doesn't show itself, but in what sense it is not? Thank you for your remark. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, the the word Kora, it's pre-Socratic or it's um, it was really uh, used in um, in tragedies and so on. It was like a normal word. <coughs> and the Kora, for example, is also this place outside the the wall of the police, and uh, it's, it's a field uh, for cultivation. But it's like um, okay, it it was for uh, sweeter dance, but it's um, not in the wall. So it, it's uh, like a, a strange um, field between uh, property and not. Um, and um, <coughs> what we can 
find in this uh, usual way to use the, the word Cora or, or other words connecting with it, I, I think it can explain more um, about the philosophical potential. And uh, why is unsubstantial? I found it out really interesting that Cora, uh, as Plato writes, is indestructible. Yes. <coughs> unsubstantial and indestructible. Well, in, in Plato's context, it's um, not so difficult to understand that, um, that Cora is unsubstantial because the only substance is uh, only the ideas, then okay. <laughs> what is not idea then is not substantial. And, um, but this passage is not so clear <laughs> because it will be dichotomical. What is not, um, what is um, uh, dichotomical between substance and not substance. Like there is no other possibilities, but there is other possibilities, there's Cora. Huh? And Cora, um, theoretically, <coughs> it would be not accept in systems like um, the Platonical one and the Aristotelian one, because they cannot think, for example, um, the, um, the emptiness or a, a vacuum between things. There is no vacuum in this kind of cosmological representation. And uh, for this, in this sense, it's uh, unsubstantial. And undestructible, uh, I find it out, out, um, also really, really interesting, because I, I think, but this is my interpretation, I think it's undestructible because it's always transforming. In this sense, there is, the, there is no substance you can destruct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.